I have to say this is an amazing venue. I've spoken in quite a few amazing venues. I expect a number of people here have. I still think the uh, salt mines of Krakow have it, but this is um, pretty damn good. And uh, yes, but amazing lights. And uh, to keep the Beatles theme, th this speech, well, you know, it'll be a bit of a hard day's night going on for ever. Um, I wanted to start by saying something about the, the European Parliament. The, to make it very clear that it isn't simply a talking shop. I think there are a lot of people, including some journalists, unfortunately, who still seem to think that that's all we do. Um, you, you know, roll over to Brussels or Strasbourg or wherever it is and chat. And in fact, in plenary sessions, we're lucky to get more than a minute's speaking time. So, you know, those of you who are looking to be in Brussels, you have to be brief, so that's when we get here, we, we can talk forever, and it will feel like it. So those who look as if they're getting a lot of speaking time in plenary sessions are either the political leaders of groups, or they are members of the European Parliament desperate for some website clips of their explanations of votes on just about everything. Um, and I really do mean that. Watch a couple of the British Conservatives. Uh, you know, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So I want to be very clear that the, in the European elections on May the 22nd this year, we are not electing people to a talking shop. We are electing people to somewhere that really matters. It matters because the European Parliament is involved in co-decision on legislation that affects the lives of about half a billion people in the European Union, the 28 countries of the EU, and at times many millions more in countries outside the European Union. So the 73 members elected from the UK have an important role in that decision making with national governments. We decide with national governments on many things on fisheries policy, where we've made substantial steps in this parliament towards ending discards at long last and restoring fish numbers in future, we hope. On financial regulation, capping the bankers' bonuses, where we're now watching the banks trying to work a way around that, and George Osborne trying to get the courts to overturn that decision. Whether it's on asylum legislation, where gender identity is now one of the grounds to be considered in asylum decisions, or workers' rights, including, say, that workers from third countries have a pension entitlement after paying into our social security systems. All of these examples are examples where Greens in the European Parliament have made a difference at the negotiating table. Just as our Green colleague Elizabeth Schroeter was doing last night, finishing work on posting of workers' directive, and as we've been doing on the data protection regulation and directive, with our rapporteur Jan Albrecht, where negotiations will continue into the next parliament. So who is sitting at the table, or whose finger is there to push the voting button, because we do actually vote electronically, we don't have to get up, run round through a door, come back, sit down, before we can do the next thing. So the finger on that button, the person at the negotiating table, really, really matters. And it's a big difference whether that person is Nigel Farage or Jean Lambert. Well, he's not going to be there to negotiate legislation or even vote most of the time. His attendance rate at plenary is about half of Keith's, but you get my point. So these elections matter for who is in the parliament. They matter for the future direction of the European Union as well. We're Greens, so I'll start by talking about climate change. As Natalie was saying earlier, the Commission recently announced its proposals for the EU strategy up to 2030. The European Parliament's response to those proposals was decided only a few weeks ago. We want to keep the 40% emissions by reduction by 2030. The Greens asked for more, but we couldn't win that. We managed to edge the 27% renewables up to 30%. Very big deal. The effect you know, the attempt to raise it to 40% was defeated. And we managed to win on having a binding target on energy efficiency at 
with a majority of 16, one six votes. So you can see whose finger is there pressing that button matters. Now this next European Parliament, the number of Greens there will play a big part. In 2015, we have the Paris Conference, which is meant to produce the successor to the Kyoto Protocol, the International Agreement on Climate reduction, Emissions Reductions. And it will trigger the next phase of EU legislation on these issues. In this room, we know the devastating effects of flooding. We've seen that on the television. We've seen the Somerset levels. We've heard the stories of kids having to poo into plastic bags. We've seen the pictures of acres of farmland underwater. Many of you will have seen the reality. We know what that will do for food production. As Keith mentioned in the Parliament, I chair the delegation for relations with countries of South Asia. So I've also seen the effects of floods in Pakistan, in Bangladesh. And when we were discussing the topic with the chair at the time of the Bangladesh Parliament's Climate Change Committee, just before Copenhagen, he said, you know, you really have to understand, climate change is here already. In Bhutan, Keith mentioned, home of the Gross National Happiness Index, we were told there that the changing climate was affecting the growth of certain medicinal plants that grow at high altitude. The production of these medicines is seen as part of the development of that country. Climate change puts that at risk. Just as it puts at risk the water supply from the Himalayas for over one and a half billion people, about 20% of the world's population who depend on it. So we know that we need real mobilisation on climate change, both within the European Parliament and outside. But we need people elected to the European Parliament who at least want to tackle the problem and want to tackle it now. So we need more Greens. Again, as Natalie was saying, we know we have the current dash for shale gas. I don't have to tell people about that in the Northwest. And it seems really strange to me that people who complain about wind turbines seem quite happy to see hundreds, if not thousands, of well heads. <laughs> we seeing at the moment, too, the potential resurgence of nuclear power. In Finland, the Olkiluoto, and I apologise for my pronunciation to Finnish colleagues, number three nuclear power station, is now five years behind in its construction. Its cost has almost trebled to eight and a half billion euros. The starting point for Hinkley C, favoured by Tory and Labour, starts at £16 billion. Pounds. Tom Burke, former FOA director and many other things, but recently said that if the world's most expensive power station is the cheapest way to fight climate change, we need a new chancellor now. Um, can I just see all those in favour of that proposal? I thought so. Overwhelming majority in NEMCON. Now, Poland, we know, sees shale gas, its energy liberation from Russia. But others, like the UK, simply seem to like fossil fuel companies. And look at what they're trying to do to strangle solar energy in this country. So we have a real struggle over the energy futures and policy direction. So again, this is why Europe needs more Greens. European Union, open or closed? The EU's motto, as it were, is unity in diversity, not division. In diversity. I represent London, which is a mega diverse city, and I'm really proud to do so. I'm proud I belong to a party which is part of a global movement, proud to belong to a political group in the Parliament that champions the right to free movement within the European Union, and a humane, open approach to those beyond our borders. London recently had a visit from Gabor Bono, leader of Hungary's Jobbik party. Ahead of the European elections, he's over here to try and drum up support. This is a racist, anti-Semitic, anti-Roma party which has links with Golden Dawn and the UK's British National Party. I want to say, if you see reports of me meeting with the BNP, be very clear that's the Bangladeshi Nationalist Party. <laughs> Not, don't please get confused. 
Jobbik is currently running at 15% in the opinion polls ahead of Hungary's general elections in April. And all the predictions are that such parties could do well in the next European elections. Now, Greens want a Europe where people are treated with respect, dignity, whoever they are, wherever they're from. And we cannot let these xenophobic, fascist parties gain ground. All right. And I know there's a major, major effort going on in the Northwest here with Peter Craney, many committed activists, to ensure that that doesn't happen. I really believe that Greens are the antidote to those parties. So Europe needs more Greens. We don't like waste. We don't like profligacy when we're looking at the economy and social Europe. But there's a difference between prudence and whatever happened to that idea and indeed its main proponent and austerity measures which strip the social core out of society and leave people in despair. Especially when austerity in some countries, we're told, is in the face of economic crisis, where it's really being used to mask ideological choices those governments would have made anyway. And yes, that includes Cameron and the British Conservatives. We have seen horrendous austerity measures imposed on certain EU countries, stripping away social Europe, stripping away solidarity. We've seen those international monetary fund policies, which we have long criticised in this party, being brought to be bare within the European Union. And we've always said it looks like the IMF only has one solution, whatever the problem. But this isn't only in the Eurozone. And remember that when you're on a platform with UKIP. Ask them, how do they explain what happened in Latvia, what happened in Hungary? They weren't in the Eurozone. You can almost feel the fuse is burning. The cause of the financial crisis wasn't the euro. It was governments stepping back from financial markets, letting them get on with it as markets know best, or at least that's what many governments seem to think. And as long as money was being made, they really didn't care how that was happening. But we know that that money was being used, it was borrowed to consume. It wasn't being borrowed to construct new infrastructure that we need to tackle climate change, to provide the jobs that go along with that. And in the European Parliament, Greens have been in the front line of the battle to ensure that measures taken to stabilise economies must take account of their effects on people's everyday lives. You have to make sure that people have enough to live a decent life, that they can afford to feed their families, that they can afford health care. We cannot undermine social and labour rights. We're making some progress, and it's tough, but we mustn't let that slip away. So again, that's another reason why Europe needs more Greens. And in the UK, we don't need, thank you very much, more members of the European Parliament who defend the city of London, who will support fracking and nuclear energy, who will support trade deals that lock in power for big business, who will not stand up for social Europe, and who consider that human rights get in the way of trade, who will not support equality of treatment, whether that's for those in London, the UK, EU nationals, or third country nationals. So the UK needs more Greens as well. And the renegotiation of the treaties that Cameron is seeking, and I thought I had to say something about that after watching him with Angela yesterday. This renegotiation where he's trying to get himself out of the hole that his backbenchers and a lot of his MPs are digging for him is not about creating a constructive, forward-thinking European Union. We all know that. He's looking for opt-outs to protect the financial city of London. He's seeking to dismantle many of the protections people enjoy at work, whether that's you know, on working time, protection for agency workers, health and safety, all under the pretext that these are red tape. It's, this renegotiation is seeking to restrict free movement, which is not such a good deal for the estimated 2.3 million UK nationals living or working elsewhere in the European Union, all the time while he's perfectly happy to see capital go wherever it likes. And as for whether he's up for you know, renegotiating some of that green crap, well, he's silent on the issue, as so often. 
So for our party, these elections really matter. I don't want to depress you. Life is depressing enough at times. But we do have to do everything that we can to keep our seats in the European Parliament and indeed add to them. So life is tough for Greens in some other countries at the moment. So we need to do our part in solidarity as part of that movement. And the fact that we have local elections at the same time in London and in a number of other places can make life even more complicated, but we're Greens, we, we're up for challenges. Otherwise, we wouldn't really be in this party, would we? Um, I don't mean the party is challenging. I mean the party faces external challenges. So the European elections, as I say, really matter. They matter for the direction of the European Union. They matter for people whose lives are affected by the decisions made at the European Union level. They matter for the planet that we share. And more Greens can make a difference. Unlike a certain other party leader down on the um, southern coast of the country at the moment, we actually know that we can do something in the European Parliament. He seems to think life there is impossible for him to make any difference. But we know, we're Greens, we can make a difference. We engage, we have an idea, we have a sense of vision. And we have a great opportunity on May the 22nd to open the next phase of our party's history and we need it to be positive. But it's not gonna happen without the involvement and commitment of everybody in this room and every party member and all those that wish us well. So the European election on May the 22nd is about shaping our common future for the common good. Thank you.